Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our sermon today is St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians in chapter 1. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Everyone likes an underdog. Everyone likes to root for the little guy who doesn't have a prayer. He doesn't have a chance. But by golly, we want to see him win. We want to see him conquer and be victorious. Because what better story is there than the little guy who takes down the big guy? We see it in our movies. You know, Rocky... That's a great story about this little guy. Although not so little, right? At least not with the, uh, the frozen cows. But the guy who didn't have a chance winning the championship. Or how about the karate kid? This poor kid who had to wax on and wax off with a crazy master. Breaks his leg and still, against all odds, wins the championship. Or how about Braveheart? I'll be honest with you, I haven't seen the movie. But I've seen the clips to know how it goes. They didn't have a prayer. And they could take their lives, but they couldn't take their... Freedom, right? Is that the right one? Because I haven't seen the movie. I'm relying on you guys. <laughs> or perhaps... It's sort of in vogue right now, even though I'm a Star Trek fan. Star Wars really is a story about the little guy. That tiny little rebellion against the mighty empire. And they are victorious. If you haven't seen the movies, I don't mean to spoil the ending, but that's how it goes. Well, what about sports? Those cubbies, right? For years, everyone was rooting for the little guy. 108 years, they stood around and rooted. And now, finally, 2016, they did it. They won. Or what about the 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team? They didn't have a prayer against those Russians. And what happens? They won. They got it. We all love the underdog. We all love the underdog so long as we're not really risking anything. Because when we actually have something to lose, we don't root for the underdog. We put our money on the sure thing, on the safe bet. We put our, our faith in what we can have assurances about. Things that we can prove and say, yes, that's, that's the winning team. That's the winning side. I'm throwing in my lot with them. Sinful man wants assurances. Sinful man wants proof. St. Paul says, for Jews demand signs. And when we look in the Gospel of Matthew, as Christ hung on the cross, those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. The Jews demanded signs. But the Greeks, the Greeks sought wisdom. One atheist has written, 
I really find it necessary to defend my position when talking with friends who believe in the existence of God. After all, my Christian friends are the ones who were making a claim about an invisible being. Certainly the burden of proof belongs to them. Or another classic argument follows this line of reasoning. If God is omnipotent, if he's all-powerful, can he then create a rock so heavy that he cannot lift it? Well, if he can't create a rock so heavy he can't lift it, he's not all-powerful. But if he does create a rock so heavy that he himself cannot lift it, then he's not all-powerful. Well, about arguments like this, C.S. Lewis wrote, Nonsense is still nonsense, even when we speak it about God. The argument's akin to saying, Can God beat himself in a fist fight? Well, who's losing? Who's winning? It's, it's ridiculous. It's folly. It's flawed, fundamentally flawed arguments. But God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Or as we heard today, the foolishness of God, his utter folly, his ridiculousness, is still more wise than the wisest thing men can think. And the weakness of God, the weakest part of Him, is still stronger than any man. You see, while we abandoned the underdog when we have something to lose, God, God loves the underdog. He loves that guy who's broken, who's fallen, who has no hope, no prayer. He loves the underdog. He is, in the eyes of the world, a fool. Because God loves mankind. God loves you. He loves you, a lost and condemned person. For God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God has redeemed you, a lost and condemned person. He has purchased and won you from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death. See, God loves the underdog so much that he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, taking the form of this underdog, being born in the likeness of men. God became the ultimate underdog. God became man to share in your pain, to share in your suffering, to share in your sorrows, in your remorse, to be tempted in every respect, just as you are, yet without sin. And then in the ultimate act of folly, God himself became sin, dying for us on the cross so that we, we might become the righteousness of God. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. God chose simple men, simple fishermen to be his apostles, his evangelists. God still chooses sinful men to be his pastors, 
to speak with his voice, to be stewards of his gifts. God chooses the poor and the infirm, the low and despised of this world, to show forth his glory, to show forth his mercy. God chooses the weak, just as when he chose David to stand before Goliath in order that he might shame the strong. God chooses what is foolish in the eyes of this world to shame those who would call themselves wise. And God chooses you. Not because you are strong or smart or handsome or beautiful or wealthy. God chooses you in spite of the fact that you might be strong or smart or handsome or beautiful or wealthy. God chooses you not because of any merit or worthiness in you but because of his fatherly, divine goodness and mercy. That's who he is. The champion of the underdog. And God has chosen you. At your baptism, he declared, You are my beloved child, in whom I am well pleased. And so, Christians, we who have inherited this this underdog from Christ, the ultimate underdog, we indeed can and are in fact commanded to boast in the Lord. Because even though the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, to you who are being saved, This foolish word of the cross is the very power of God unto salvation. And it pleases God to save you through this foolish preaching about a God who dies. Through this foolishness of Christ crucified. He is the stumbling block to the Jews who demand signs He is folly incarnate for the Greeks, the Gentiles, who seek wisdom. But to us, to us he is the power of God, the wisdom of God, the very source of life, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. So be proud to play the fool. Be proud to be the underdog. Be proud of your foolishness. And let no one put you to shame for the sake of Christ. For we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So brothers and sisters, boast in the Lord. Boast in the Lord because He is boasting in you. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.